you. There are many uh, familiar faces in the audience, um, and thank you, Maria Strong. Uh, actually, I think this is my first formal event as Register of Copyrights, uh, so um, it's uh, wonderful to be here today. Um, I just wanted to take the time to welcome you to this event. Uh, we look forward to really hearing from all of you in terms of your perspectives. As many of you know, we had our last public round time, public round table way back, I think, in 2016. Uh, so there have been a number of developments, both on the domestic and on the international side, that we really want to make sure as we continue our research and actual drafting of our report and recommendation that we are aware of. So we wanted to take the time to really go over any specific developments that you think would be important for us to know um, that have happened between 2017 and the current day. So we look forward to um, a very energetic conversation. I know um, when we had our roundtables in 2016, my former colleague Jacqueline Charlesworth kind of coined the term that we were um, talking uh, in in uh, terms of a tale of two cities uh, because we really had very, very different perspectives in terms of how the DMCA was working or not working. And one of the questions we will like to discuss today is whether those perspectives have changed at all, whether um, there has been either a more developments on the voluntary side, more case developments, nor, more international developments, where maybe we don't have um, the uh, stark differences that we've had in the past. Uh, so uh, again, I would welcome you. We have over 50 participants, I believe, um, in the course of the day. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from each one of you in terms of how your perspectives may have changed since 2017, or um, obviously if your pe perspectives have not changed, hearing that as well. So thank you, and we look forward to the uh, discussion. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Maria. Um, so welcome, everyone. Karen gave a good introduction to the topics we're supposed to be here on, so I will provide a little bit of the uh, housekeeping orders. Um, just so you know, I think everyone who is participating, your mics are now on, and I think maybe starting by turning them off would be a good idea um, for the court reporter. <laughs> but uh, we will call uh, on people by tipping your placards up, at which point turn your mic on. If you can remember to turn it off, it, um, I think we'll just help the audio. Uh, of it. Um, if there are those in the audience who wish to speak on other issues, we're going to have an open mic session at um, the end of today. And right by the water over there, there is a sign up sheet. So uh, my name is Reagan Smith. I'm the general counsel of the Copyright Office. And I'll ask my colleagues to introduce themselves. I'm Brad Greenberg. I am counsel for policy and international affairs. Kevin Amer, deputy general counsel. <laughs> Kimberly Isbell, Senior Counsel for Policy and International Affairs. And Maria Strong, Deputy Director for Policy and International Affairs. So this is session one, which is about domestic case law. We're looking to find a way um, to talk about judicial decisions that have occurred since the close of the written comment period in February 2017, as well as those uh, effects on business or user practices or in your experience. So I think we'll start um, with everyone um, going around, stating your name, your affiliation, and maybe very high level, 45 seconds um, you know, uh, view of what you think are the most important issues. Mr. Carey? Sure, thank you. Good morning, I'm Eric Carey here from NMPA. I'm here on behalf of the music publishing and songwriting industry, and I'm grateful to provide our perspective on developments concerning the Section 512 Safe Harbors. As the Copyright Office notes, the BMGV Cox case highlights an important development from our perspective, namely the opportunity for the successful enforcement of the plain language of the DMCA, where service has enabled repeat infringers in massive scale on its own network. But for present purposes, this has not changed the music community's perspective on the DMCA. Enforcement in the BMG litigation involved the most extreme of circumstances. Millions of notices sent, an ISP failing to enforce its own 13-strike policy, and at least $8 million in attorney's fees to bring the case to judgment. This is not a feasible mechanism for enforcement. Indeed, this is a heavy burden for all of our members who run the gamut from major music publishers to individual creators. On a daily basis, we continue to see an enforcement system gained, not just by whack-a-mole, but with the whole fleet of amusement park gimmicks used to confuse notice senders. On the ground level of anti-piracy enforcement, the system shows itself to be rigged time and again. 
In its original embodiment, the DMCA was intended to help the development of a fledgling internet. Congress envisioned a future where, quote, service providers and copyright owners would cooperate to detect and deal with copyright infringements. That from the House and Senate reports accompanying the DMCA. Now, 21 years later, the DMCA has helped to create some of the world's most powerful companies on earth. Yet the onus continues to be on copyright owners to police the behavior of these tech giants. Time is overdue for recalibration. The building has been built. It is time for the scaffolding to come down and traffic to be restored in the name of a more vibrant city. While I appreciate for administrative reasons the divide of panels between domestic and international views, I would encourage the office to not be siloed in its perspective or conclusions. The legislative process of oh, New York Mr. Curry. represents I may need to ask you to wrap it up because sure. I think we have a, a long panel of you know exceptional colleagues and um, we're going to have to limit everyone to 45 seconds. Great. Okay. Thank Represents you. a great opportunity for development and consideration of all the issues we'll be talking about today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hatfield? <clears throat> I'm Ken Hatfield, representing <laughs> the Artists' Rights Caucus of Local 802, the American Federation of Musicians' largest chapter. We view Section 512 as an unfair loophole that permits service providers to profit from mass infringement of our rights with near impunity. The case law of the past three years does little to change that because litigation alone will not rectify the flaws in the law itself. We feel that the safe harbors adopted at the dawn of the commercial web have been implemented or interpreted in ways that are at odds with the stated intentions of Congress. Over 20 years after President Clinton passed the DMC, uh, signed the DMCA, Neither the active cooperation between the platforms and the creators nor the standard technical measures envisioned by Congress have materialized. Reform of Section 512 is needed to restore the rights and livelihoods of musicians. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lemon? Hi, my name is Mike Lemon and I'm with the Internet Association. IA represents over 40 of the world's leading internet companies and is the only trade association that exclusively represents leading global internet companies on matters of public policy. Uh, we believe that the DMCA has created incentives that drive success for content and for internet and tech. Uh, the relationship between the internet industry and content is continually shifting and the last three years have been no different. Uh, and the DMCA has created the right incentives to uh, increase collaboration, increase licensing, increase driving folks who use internet platforms towards content and we think that the DMCA should continue to be allowed to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Osterreicher. Good morning. I'm Mickey Osterreicher, General Counsel for the National Press Photographers Association. Because online traffic is image driven, a recent study estimates that more than 2.5 billion visual works are stolen every day with the U.S. accounting for 23% of those infringements. Faced with overwhelming litigation costs, a takedown notice may be the only alternative photographers have to combat these rampant misappropriations, albeit without compensation. But those notices are encumbered by lens fair use repercussions, Myris knowledge considerations, counterclaim requirements, and whack-a-mole stay down nightmares. We welcome another robust discussion of domestic safe harbor issues and believe the newly established EU obligations for OSPs could help inform our conversation. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to a productive day. Thank you. Ms. Pariser? I guess if you were looking to find out whether anything's changed in the last two years, we could <laughs> probably all go home now, but since I went to the trouble of writing this out. Um, cases in the last two years uh, around repeat infringer have been uh, promising, uh, but overall piracy continues to devastate the uh, content industries. I'm sorry, I did, forgot to introduce myself. I'm Jenny Pariser from the Motion Picture Association. The Cox and Grande cases have been welcome, but rather obvious outcomes given the facts in those cases, while Mavericks and Zazzle uh, are of limited applicability given the limited facts of those cases. Meanwhile, um, the real story is about the fact that the notice and takedown cases have quietly marched on uh, without any recognition of red flag notice, uh, representative list. Uh, the Ninth Circuit even recognized that uh, effective uh, uh, red flag notice is all but gone from the law. Uh, and from our perspective, uh, and meanwhile, the service provider 
definitions have expanded to encompass every type of internet uh, actor uh, around. Accordingly, from our perspective, it's still pretty much all bad news. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rose. Hi, I am Meredith Rose from Public Knowledge. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate. Uh, Section 512 is part, a central part of a vast and delicately balanced body of modern copyright law. We can no more sever or upend 512 within modern copyright than we can sever Section 1201 or any other part of the DMCA, because without it, the system collapses wholesale. Given this, we must reckon with the intersection of broadband providers specifically, Section 512, and the Supreme Court's 2017 decision in Packingham versus North Carolina, which recognized a First Amendment interest in being able to speak uh, and to be spoken to online. Over 50 million homes in America have access to only one broadband provider, and their First Amendment interests cannot be curtailed based upon unverified, unadjudicated <laughs> accusations alone of copyright infringement. Packingham requires that when discussing broadband providers who act as gatekeepers to the entire internet, we must carefully re-examine what constitutes appropriate circumstances for account termination and how that in turn impacts the knowledge standard for secondary liability. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shamiri. Uh, good morning. My name is Aus Shemery from Image Rights International. And um, in our perspective, the Live Journal decision, it's certainly been a welcome one. It's a step in the right direction. And it shows a court's increasing willingness to scrutinize uh, relationships that ISPs have had with their user communities. Uh, increasingly, many ISPs have been taking on a more interactive and a curated relationship with their users uh, to their benefit and to their, uh, to their profit. And it's something that's left out uh, many of the content uh, generators uh, who, who create this content. And so um, there's still a circuit split, and unfortunately the Supreme Court hasn't resolved it. And so I think uh, case law alone is not going to resolve this issue. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Turek? <laughs> Hi, Rasti Turek for PEX. Um, <clears throat> this is my first panel. So um, I don't know about the case law yet, but um, I think the technical challenges pose that uh, rights holders bear the cost of takedowns. And um, the true challenge is even if there is a technical solution to all of these, the platforms essentially start pushing against um, any active measurements meaning crawling or anything else. And so they will actively try to prevent any actions from the rights holders to be able to um, identify their content. And um, as such, I think there is a disbalance um, or the platforms have to be more accountable for um, the whole processes or have to be more forced to be open-minded or forced to be open in general um, to the rights holders to be able to identify their own works at scale. Thanks very much. Professor Tushnet. Uh, Rebecca Tushnet, Harvard Law and the Organization for Transformative Works. So um, the case law tells us the same thing as the UC Berkeley study of takedown practices, which is that there are many successful models out there. And even very big sites like ours, which have millions of users, millions of works, can receive very few legitimate takedowns. Amazon's Kindle Worlds, for example, mostly receives anti-competitive takedowns from competing writers trying to get books off the list. Reflecting the difficulty of fighting back at the individual level, only one 512F case of which I'm aware, called Quill Inc., has been brought based on a Kindle Worlds takedown. But generally, 512 and its implementation by different platforms have encouraged an explosion of expression, and by contrast, rules written as if YouTube was the model would crush the alternatives and ensure that there was only YouTube. Thank you. Mr. Willen? Uh, I'm Brian Willen, a partner at Wilson Sonsini. Uh, I've litigated DMCA cases for a decade, and I also advise a number of uh, online services, uh, large and small, about the safe harbors and how to comply with them. So I'm here to tell you that the DMCA works uh, and continues to work. The basic bargain that the statute strikes is the right one. Uh, it encourages and it actually fosters cooperation between platforms and rights holders. Uh, the statute puts real obligations on platforms while keeping the main burden of enforcement where it belongs on copyright owners who have the best knowledge of their works and who benefit the most from them. Now, while I could quibble about individual rulings, uh, the courts are getting it right. Uh, in particular, I would point uh, everyone to the, the recent Ninth Circuit decision in Ventura versus Motherless, uh, which in my mind is a model of, of DMCA interpretation. 
um, as a result of both the statute and the case law, uh, legitimate services that have real social value, uh, that are home to original works, and that have meaningful anti-piracy uh, policies have been protected by the safe harbor and thrived, while at the same time, piratical services, which mainly encourage or induce infringement, uh, have faced the consequences. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winterton? I'm Robert Winterton. I'm representing uh, NetChoice here today. Um, uh, Section 512 was intelligently created to apply copyright responsibilities to the least cost avoider, the owner of the content. 512 avoids the unfair obligation for every platform for free speech to be aware of all copyrighted content, even if it is not registered with the Copyright Office. We've seen a, copy, a cottage industry grow to help copyright holders protect their property with services like Mark Monitor. At the same time, 512 has empowered the growth of platforms for artists, creators, and all Americans wishing to express themselves. Without 512, we would see significant demuniation of online platforms and lock-in of large companies that might have the manpower to monitor, that can only have the manpower to monitor all content. While the notice and takedown approach of 512 strikes the right balance, we are seeing efforts internationally to flip 512 on its head. Take, for example, Europe's recent Article 13, which essentially oh. requires any website with a comments section to know every copyrighted content in existence. Perhaps we should take that one on the international panel. Yes, so. yeah. I'm, I'm not going on too far on that. Okay. To protect American innovators, artists and platforms in the United States should take the lead in opposing these efforts to undermine creativity. This protection would come in form of bringing 512 around the world. The US Copyright Office should work with the White House and Congress to incorporate 512 into trade agreements. Now is our time to st uh, act to stymie uh, attempts to undermine free speech and creativity in the United States. Thank you. Um, so let's start talking, just diving into some of the cases, and then we can see where that takes us. So um, Ms. Pariser, you mentioned repeat infringer had seen something evolve. Is that a bright spot from your perspective? Do you think that Cox or Grande or Motherless, do you agree with Mr. Willen that they've gotten this right? I'm going to distinguish Cox and Grande on the one hand from Motherless on the other. Um, n no question, Cox and Grande were correctly decided as far as they went uh, on the repeat infringer point. I'm going to leave aside the Fourth Circuit's decision around contributory liability uh, and the jury instruction. Um, we take some issue with that, that part of the holding. Uh, but limiting ourselves just to the repeat infringer aspect of the decision, sure, those are bright spots. Um, but uh, what's curious about it is why are they so bright? Um, a court uh, said the DMCA actually means what it says. And we all threw ourselves a party because for the last 10 years, that hasn't really been happening. And instead, courts have said, Representative list, that that Congress didn't really mean that. Uh, red flag notice doesn't really mean that. So finally, the courts have said yes. Repeat infringer means that if you get multiple notices from the same user, uh, you need to do something about it. You need to have a policy, and you need to reasonably implement it. And that policy needs to end in terminations. Um, those decisions are correct, yet, frankly, somewhat obvious. Um, motherless is sort of a mixed bag, I would say. Um, uh, we take issue to large extent with the notion that any kind of policy that a service can dream up, uh, written, unwritten, no clear uh, rules as to how many notices need to be uh, sent, uh, what termination means, uh, what, uh, how the operator is going to implement that, and indeed, the, the most troubling aspect of it is that the site operator doesn't even need to keep the notices or keep track of them. Uh, the facts of Motherless is that the operator simply said, I rem it's like that scene in uh, Guys and Dolls, I remember where the spots are on the dice. That's what the guy said. He said, you know, I kind of remember how many notices uh, I got on a given uh, person, and so I'm going to terminate them. The, the good news is that, you know, he actually terminated some 2,000 individuals. Uh, I guess that's not good news, but <laughs> in the fact, 
in the facts of the case that actually happened. So that's, that's a welcome uh, uh, hallmark. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, if you'd like to speak and comment upon this, you can tip your placard up. I think I did forget to mention, if you have not signed a video release, you will notice the cameras and they are out in the back. Um, Professor Tushnet. Thank you. So I think this feeds really well into my point about the m massive variety of sites out there needing and relying on the DMCA. So Motherless is a one-person operation, uh, and uh, its policies should not have to be like YouTube's policies. Uh, and the key flexibility of the DMCA, which I think the Motherless Court recognized, is that uh, it is not right to require the same things. Uh, with respect to the clarity of the policies, the record keeping, and so on, right? So this is a guy who, you know, if, uh, if a server goes down, all his records are gone. Should he lose all DMTA cases in the future? I think that's an important consideration going forward. So do you think the courts have sort of harmonized that by allowing, you know, motherless to, to implement a different type of policy so long as it's implemented compared to, you know, the way the Cox or the Casa Grande courts are looking at those larger companies? So I think the motherless court was, uh, was absolutely correct to focus on the nature of the specific business. And the other thing I would mention is also, you know, we see a lot of variety in the kinds of sites. So our site, although very large relatively, does not get a lot of DMCA notices because that's not the kind of thing that people post on it. So the, when we talk about sort of blanket obligations, we want to keep in mind that even very large sites may not be the kind of environment that you're hearing about from some of the other people. Thank you. Mr. Willen? Thank you. Uh, just, just picking up on what Professor Tushnet mm -hmm. said, I think the, the important <coughs> aspect of motherless is, is recognizing what I think is clear, at least uh, from the language of the statute, which is that this, especially when we're talking about repeat infringer policies, we're not talking about a one-size-fits-all policy. Appropriate circumstances is the language that Congress used. The legislative history supports this. The idea is that uh, you don't want to have a straitjacket when it comes to thinking about what's appropriate for a given site. The size of the site, the nature of the site, the nature of the content, the nature of the user base, all of these things are, are critical in thinking about what appropriate circumstances are. Do you think there's a bare minimum now um, within the courts of what a repeat infringer policy should be to be acceptable? Well, I mean, I think obviously a lot of courts and a lot of policies have focused on strikes that are assigned based on DMCA notices or the equivalent mm -hmm. of DMCA notices. So I think that creates um, a, a clustering in the way that, I mean, I represent, as I said, a lot of, of small platforms. Um, and so Big that- Big platforms too, right? Yeah, okay. for, for sure. Um, so, so, but even within a, a strikes world, a three strikes world, two strikes world, whatever, 13. No, I'm 13. Well, I mean, but I think that, I mean, look, I, th I think Cox, at least on repeat infringer, is probably right. Those facts are, are really bad, and, and it, it, it seems that they were deliberately not trying to terminate people, so fine. Uh, but in terms of what their policy was, I think you have to understand that in the context, this is an ISP. Um, when, when, when somebody is terminated from an ISP, the consequences are quite severe and drastic. This is different, Ms. Rose's point, right? Right. I mean, d different from losing your rights to an individual, you know, an individual service where it's just a 512C service. So, so all of those things matter. One other thing I would say is, is the importance in thinking about repeat infringer policies of, of copyright education. So this is something I talk to, to my clients a lot about. You know, the, the idea of repeat infringer is you, you want to get the bad users off the site. There's a lot of users who may put up things that somebody says are infringing that, that are not trying to engage in piracy. They are fans of work. They don't know the rules. And part of the really important aspect of what you can do as a platform with a flexible repeat infringer policy is use a first strike or maybe even a second strike as a vehicle for educating users about the rules. Um, and so it's really important in implementing the, the policy not to lose sight of that. Thank you. Mr. Curry, did you want to engage with that? Sure. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with some of the uh, remarks that were just made, um, specifically going back to the idea of appropriate circumstances with respect to a repeat infringer policy. And as Ms. Prazer said, um, you know, again, what we've seen in these cases is the statute actually being interpreted according to its plain language and giving the opportunity to exercise that right. Um, I can speak a little bit to the perspective of the industry on bringing some of these cases and as practicality in a larger sense within the entirety of Section 512 of whether this is a reasonable uh, means for vindicating and enforcing our rights. Um, you know, these cases, um, as I mentioned earlier, 
um, were bought over many years and it had a difficult uphill battle to try and just get these um, off the ground in the first instance. Having seen in litigation um, on the Groove Shark case, for instance, as was a predecessor, but is a tremendous amount of effort on the content owner to try and reverse engineer a uh, ISP or service provider's own uh, infringer policy. It requires massive amounts of discovery, um, a massive amount of kind of tech knowledge, and then, you know, once you get to that point, you're lucky to be able to try and litigate. So, so do you agree that, or it sounds like you disagree, that the burden should be on the copyright owners um, more squarely in the DMCA? I think I, I, I disagree that the burden should be squarely on copyright mm -hmm. owners. I think there should be a... a, and, a and do you think these cases have helped shift that at all, at least with respect to repeat infringer? I think what these are cases represent are successful efforts at enforcement. Um, I think it's, I, I don't see them as, as necessarily um, shifting balance, but just recognizing the, the proper balance and giving an opportunity to be able to enforce rights according to what the statute intended. In the Cox and Grande cases, if these circumstances didn't constitute um, a failure to enforce a repeat infringer policy, then we don't know what would. But, I mean, you said these aren't a shifting balance, but a return to the proper balance. Isn't that, in effect, a shifting balance or swinging to the pendulum back towards what you think Congress intended more, at least in the area of repeat infringer? I wouldn't deny that these are positive developments, right? They, we, they, you know, um, you know, we've seen our rights vindicated and we've seen, you know, we've, we've been given a tool in these cases. But that doesn't mean that the entirety of the uh, mechanism for enforcement um, is, as, is completely shifted balance. Okay, I'm going to call on the people with their placards up and then try to move to another topic after that. So, Mr. Ostreicher, do you agree? Has this become an effective enforcement tool? I actually was going to move, try and move to a, a different case. Would that be appropriate now? What case are you moving to? So, I'm, I'd like to talk a little bit about Fourth Estate and the implications. Uh, I don't think we're going to talk about Fourth Estate right now. Um, let's try to wrap up this topic. Okay. But also, when you do talk, um, if you can tip up the mic. I think Mr. Hatfield is next. I. I'm listening to this, and forgive me, I'm not a lawyer, but when you're talking about we have to have one set of standards for somebody that's an individual that runs an ISP on their own, that doesn't sound unreasonable to me. What sounds unreasonable is that when that lowest common denominator is then applied to the giants. I think that the solution should be focused more on things like upload filters. If you want to put the onus on the, the copyright owners, in the case of music, make sure that all the music has ISRC codes or something similar. The, the Music Modernization Act under the uh, Mechanical Licensing Collective, if your music doesn't have an ISRC code, you're not going to get paid. There's incentive for the musicians to take responsibility, and I think we should. I'm sure that's going to apply to other forms of copyright protected material. But the bottom line is, we created the work. We not only spent the time and effort to do it, but if, you're, if you do the kind of stuff I do, which is like live musicians playing an acoustic, acoustic instruments together at the same time, and you live in an urban area, there aren't any recording studios left. It's incredibly expensive. My last project was a simple jazz project. It cost me 30 grand just to pay the musicians in the studio, and I get a statement from a streamer for a quarter of a million streams, and it's a joke. It's less money than I get for one, selling one CD live. The point is, is that the all the courts can do is interpret the law. If there's a fundamental flaw in the way in which 512 has been implemented, which is that the onus is supposed to fall, you, you, the interpretation of the large, uh, or the, the people that are on the other side, for, for lack of a better way of characterizing it, is that it should, the onus should be on us. There are things out here like Cloudflare that gives complete anonymity to the user. How can we possibly ch chase them? And when you look at the cost of litigation, just sending a, a simple threat letter of a takedown uh, to, a, to somebody costs between $1,500 and $3,000. And when, uh, when there are studies that say that a court case can go run from $385,000 to up, up to $2 million, and that's even an old estimate from the Columbia Law Journal, it's virtually impossible for musicians. Some musicians don't make that in like a decade or a lifetime. So, it, what happens is it's like it, when you delay the justice because it costs so much money, you kill people like, like myself, musicians. Any musician that li releases a record will tell you that the prime earning time is the first 18 months. I don't know any cases that come to court that, that get resolved in 18 months. But meanwhile, people that are infringing our copyright are making money from that 
and they use that money against us to hire better lawyers than we can hire. How can that possibly like be a fair system? I'm sorry, I've, I've gone. No, there's a lot of issues, far. but in terms of five twelve, right? Can you can is it? Five twelve is not. Five twelve has been either implemented or interpreted in ways that basically <coughs> create a fertile ground for dragging the cases out, so that it basically denies copyright owners that are indie, indie musicians or indie anything, filmmakers, it denies us any real semblance of justice. We can't possibly afford it. I mean, I'm, Thank you. without talking about the specific case, because I'm not supposed to, I'm involved in a, I was put into a, a class action lawsuit. Now, this case, I'm not supposed to talk Okay, I, I don't want, I, I don't want I, you to get on the record okay. saying anything you're not supposed to talk about. Right, right, Can I, I, yeah. I, 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 I word, <laughs> forgive me, I word, I'm a jazz musician. I, I, All right. What's the famous uh, Shelly Mann thing? I'm a jazz musician. I never play the same thing once. Okay. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm improvising here, so forgive me. But the, the point is, is that we can't possibly ch chase the individuals. First of all, if you catch them, they don't have any money. The, uh, the idea is that the people that are profiting from it should be held to at least the same level of responsibility that they're demanding of us, which is if you profit from my work, Give me an equitable percentage of that. Don't tell me that, well, technically there's this loophole over here that says okay. uh, that, that you don't have to, and, and that's what 512 is. It's a loophole. Thank you, Mr. Hatfield. We appreciate the, the improvisation and all of your points. Ms. Rose, does that move you at all, talking about the difficulties of enforcement, if you wanted to engage with, uh, on the user side, um, the First Amendment concerns you raised? Yeah, so I wanted to sort of bring this back and just is put this out there for further discussions. I think one of the most complicated parts of 512 is that it is applied to both broadband ISP providers and online platforms, and the stakes in both of these, as has been raised before, are very, very different levels of stakes. Um, and okay, anyone who's familiar with the work of public knowledge will say that it is not often that we go to bat and say that ISPs, you know, are like we agree with them on something. Um, but the reality is that it is the policy of the United States government to increase access to the internet. Uh, ISPs and broadband providers are the gatekeepers, not just to social media, which was the, the degree of access at stake in Packingham, but to the entire internet. Uh, to eject someone from that network is a very, very serious implication of core First Amendment rights that have been recognized by the Supreme Court. And so I just urge folks, when having this discussion, to be very mindful that the, the you know, stakes of being punted off of YouTube and the stakes of being punted off of Comcast when Comcast is your only broadband service provider uh, are two very different sets of stakes. So that, that brings up a, an important point, I think, and one that came up certainly during the last round tables, and this idea that, that you know that there's an important distinction between 512A service providers, conduits uh, on the one hand, and, and for example, 512C. Uh, service providers. And in the last round tables, we heard a lot, this is pre-Cox, obviously, we heard uh, from 512A conduit service providers that their practice at that time was to reject uh, notices that they would receive that were submitted pursuant to, to 512C. Um, Cox obviously uh, cast some doubt on, on that practice. I, I wonder if, if you know or any of the other panelists have a sense of the extent to which those practices have changed in light of Cox and the other cases? In other words, how, in your experience, do content owners today go about uh, notifying conduit service providers uh, that infringement is occurring on their services? And has that changed in the wake of, of Cox and other cases? Uh, I do not know. I don't have any sort of specific knowledge on, on the content end about how the notices have been handled since then. Anyone else have? insights on that? There's just general awareness that practices have changed in response to the decisions in Cox. Um, obviously, there's continued litigation on this front, so I think we'll continue to see how the trend evolves. Uh, we have the Grandi case and the Charter case is now being litigated, but there's a general awareness of policies having changed, which again speaks to whether this is a effective uh, means of enforcement on a day-to-day -day basis. If, you know, for instance, ISPs you know, uh, learn from these cases, implement uh, effective repeat infringer policies, and, um, you know, we're still trying to figure out how best to cooperate and restore this balance that we've now talked about. Okay, I just want to follow up a little bit with Ms. Rose. You've indicated that Packingham indicates that <coughs> there's a First Amendment interest in being able to get onto the Internet. 
Um, do you see terminations pursuant to a repeat infringer policy being state action? So I think that there is, I think, so I think that there is some, some, there is obviously, it is not state action directly. It's not a statute coming down and saying you absolutely must, but you must in order to uh, avail yourself of this 512i safe harbor. Um, I think that as a practical matter, this becomes equivalent to state action uh, in the context that, you know, the potential damages for secondary liability for copyright infringement are so massive um, that the natural and necessary reaction is to say, seek a safe harbor. But what about um, as a legal matter? What's that? You said as a practical matter. As a legal matter, do you think it's tantamount to state action? No, I think that there. I think that there is some gradation uh, there. Obviously, this is you know this is in in the case of Packingham, it was a specific statute coming from North Carolina that says if you are on the sex offender registry, you may not access social media as defined with anything with a comment section, um, and that was a specific state bar. Um, I think we are you know packing came came out two years ago I think the degree of what kinds of uh, safe harbors and what kinds of statutes and require legal requirements constitute state action is something that we are going to be seeing a lot of litigation over in the coming years and so I think this is very much an open topic you said there's a gradation but then where would you put voluntary measures on that which are negotiated in the shadow of 512 I think that those certainly raise policy concerns uh, at a very minimum, given that we, you know, the federal government has set a policy of increasing access to the internet rather than decreasing it, um, and to only, uh, specifically to only uh, terminate access or prohibit access in very extreme circumstances. I mean, in the case of Packingham, it was someone who was on the sex offender registry for child pornography. Uh, and that, that particular trigger for the statute was not considered sufficient, uh, sufficiently grave to completely eliminate his First Amendment interest in being able to access the internet. Um, so the short answer is I think this is very much an area that is in flux uh, and that we are going to have to watch as it goes through and how this potentially uh, impacts 512 I safe harbors in the context of ISPs and broadband providers. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Tushnet, did you want to respond on this issue? Um, I did, thank you. So I've actually written a little about the mm -hmm. state action question in this uh, in this context, in the intermediary liability context, and um, so more than I can say here, but uh, it's been clear since New York <laughs> Times versus Sullivan that the scope of the rights the state enables have First Amendment implications because the judiciary actually counts as a state actor for state action purposes. So, um, you know, uh, 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 I actually refer, I've written a longer paper about it, but I, I, I do think it does, it, it, uh, that you can't just say it's private action. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Prazer, did you want to add to that? And then I think I do want to move next to 512C. We'll get out of the ISP space and talk about uh, moderation and the live journal case. Yeah, just briefly, um, touching on a few points that have been made, um, we don't disagree that a uh, appropriate uh, repeat infringer policy uh, indeed takes uh, note of the statutory uh, command that the uh, termination be in appropriate circumstances, uh, a phrase that helps uh, teach uh, that different, can encompass uh, not just what, how many strikes, the nature of the infringement, but also the nature of the service. Uh, we don't disagree that different types of services, different types of providers can have different types of policies, provided that they are actual policies and not uh, pro hoc made up ones that, uh, you know, don't really, don't really pass muster. On, on First Amendment consideration, um, you know, it's, it's our position that uh, a repeat infringer uh, obligation does not implicate First Amendment concerns because there is no state action. Moreover, unlike in Packingham, uh, termination from, in yes, there are some rural areas in the United States where perhaps a single internet provider is available, but in general, termination from one ISP is not the death knell to one's internet connectivity. Thank you. Um, so moving on to, to the Mavericks case. So this was a website, oh no they didn't, where volunteer moderators looked for whether or not posts were new and exciting celebrity news and over two thirds of comments didn't could put up. Did that, case come out the right way? Does that have meaningful import into Section 512 in general? Mr. Shamiri? 
I believe so. Um, what was rather uh, curious about the case, uh, prior to the, uh, to the appeal and the holding, uh, there wasn't a lot of success on the plaintiff's side for appealing such decisions, unless we're talking about an ISP uh, that's particularly pirate-oriented, if you will. And, um, you know, this case, w the decision which came right on the heels of um, BWP, I believe, uh, by a number of months, which held quite differently, where uh, some users were deemed uh, <coughs> independent contractors and not acting on behalf of the ISP, uh, I think Live Journal rightly held that um, many of these sites that have editorial like posts where they have some staff uploading their own material, their employees and their considered staff of the ISPs, they have this rather intricate relationship with their users in which they are curating the content, they are seeing to it that the content is favorable and uh, worthy of generating profit on their end. And so to, um, uh, to kind of echo on, on your point, Mr. Hadfield, uh, you know, sites like LiveJournal, they are, they are profiting from this content, and there is some sort of review. And so it's just natural that uh, they didn't enjoy, if you will, 512 protections. Mr. Willen, do you agree? Do you think um, cases like that are helping build out the financial benefit standard or ability to control through through moderation? Does it matter that they were, you know, volunteers or volunteers applying a standard set by the site? Yeah. Well, let me let me just sort of step back and and, and I, I think that there's sort of two issues. So one is the question of of at what point are sites looking at and potentially reviewing or curating content and. The, the concern that the Live Journal case raised was that any sort of, of pre-upload review or moderation could potentially take you outside of 512C. I think that was probably a misreading of Live Journal at the time, but I think the, the decision in Mother List that, that followed Live Journal, also from the Ninth Circuit a few months later, very helpfully clarifies that services can do uh, pre-upload review and moderation of content, in particular to look for uh, infringing material, illegal material, material that doesn't fit within their service. But what do you mean by material that doesn't argument. fit within your service? So in Motherless, it was everything legal stays. So that, you know, seems to kind of make sense under 512M. But the court said, well, we don't know, you know, what if he was going to kick out the cute cat videos, which certainly would make me not watch that site. But, <laughs> you know, uh, would that have made a difference? Yeah. So I don't, I mean, I don't think it would have. I mean, it, you know, the, the court, there, there was characterization of everything, legal, everything that is legal stays. I don't think actually that was what Motherless was doing. There, were, there was certainly some stuff that wasn't illegal under U.S. law that they were allowing up on the site. Um, but in any event, I mean, I think the, the real point is the, so, and this is where I think the intersection of, of, of Section 512 and uh, Section 230 is really, really important. So we know from Section 230 that Congress wanted and encouraged and created a specific legal protection for online services to uh, remove and filter, and uh, in particular, to try to get uh, inappropriate, offensive, uh, sexually explicit content off of their sites if they didn't want it on their sites. So the idea that, that simultaneously you could have a regime where services that are doing the specific thing that Section 512C uh, encourages them to do and protects them from doing would lose their safe harbor protection, I think is a regime that doesn't make any sense. It certainly isn't good for services, isn't good for users, isn't good for society, and frankly, isn't good for copyright owners. So, so, yeah. Oh, so just to sort of pick up on that point a little bit. <clears throat> so, I mean, it, the way the Mavericks Court articulated the standard for when some when um, uh, material is stored at the direction of the user is to say that, well, if, if, the, if the service provider carried out activities that were narrowly directed towards enhancing the accessibility of the posts, then, um, you know, and so, you know, that was also an issue in the, in the YouTube case yeah. in the Second Circuit where you had sort of automated algorithms, um, you know, suggesting videos that you might want to watch. The court said, okay, that's, that's at the direction of users. So um, is there any room in your understanding for sort of um, curation within that standard? I mean, the, the example in Motherless obviously is the, you know, um, 
kicking out cat videos or something, that yeah. th videos that don't sort of fit within the, the theme of, of the website. It, is, th is there any sort of room for that type of activity in your view? Yeah, I, I, think, I think there is and I think there has to be. Um, so, you know, I, I, I litigate the Viacom case. So I'm, I'm certainly familiar with, with where that language comes from. And, you know, there, one of the, one of the issues was the use of, of related videos, suggested videos through, through YouTube. Um, and, and that's certainly a form of, of curation and moderation where you're, you're essentially telling people, well, you like this and you might like this as well. But more, more broadly, this is something that, that really every service now does some form of. Every service is in some sense expected to do some form of. When, when we talk about curation, what we really mean is, is making some effort to uh, sort of help users sort through a mass of, of user-generated content and find things that they might like. Um, and the idea that you can't, that you shouldn't be able to do that while still be protected by the safe harbors, I, I think what, what you'd end up with in, in a world where that was the law is a bunch of junky sites that no one wanted to use. Well, what about though, I mean, you know, it, I think back to Aereo where Justice Scalia in his dissent said, you know, and obviously the question of volitional conduct is, is yeah. still sort of unsettled, but it, isn't it sort of a clearly, you know, a, an administrable rule to say that, well, okay, if, if someone is choosing the content, um, that might, ordinarily that's going to tip them over the line into direct infringement, isn't it? Because they're going to, um, you know, acting with sufficient volition that they actually are choosing the content that goes up on the site. So how, yeah. you know, how is that reconcilable with what you're describing. Yeah, well, let me, let me distinguish between two things. So the, the, the situation, and, and this is why LiveJournal in some ways was an unusual and maybe, maybe extreme case, and I think there's a way that the Ninth Circuit probably meant to write that decision that, that reflects this, which is that what LiveJournal was doing was essentially people were submitting things without actually making them go live on the site, and the ultimate decision about what would be posted and what would be part of the Oh No, They Didn't uh, blog or, or uh, service what was fundamentally being made by the, by the platform. And I think there's a world in which you could say, look, if, if what you are doing is that degree of, of ex-ante selection, right, you are essentially a, 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 a publisher of sorts in the way that, that a book publisher is. You get a bunch of manuscripts and you, you say, um, we're going to publish 10 out of 100. I think that does start to put pressure on, on the 512C safe harbors. So, but I would distinguish that fundamentally from services, and we could talk about YouTube, that there's, there's many others that we could talk about, that, that essentially let people with, with limits post what they want. And then one thing, once things are up on the service, they make efforts, whether through search, whether through uh, functionality that recommends content, whether through um, putting content into different categories that are, that are fundamentally designed to say, um, here, here's, what's, here's what's useful, here's what's good. At the same time, those services, and you know, this is something that, that increasingly they are forced by public policy and legal considerations to do, is to say there's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't want on our service. We don't want terrorist content. We don't want pornography. We don't want these things. Whether or not they're, they're actually legal, we don't want them on our site. Um, and the idea that if you're doing that, if you're making those kinds of, of, of selections, that you're, you're jeopardizing your safe harbor, I think is, from a public policy perspective is very troubling. I just want to circle back to your discussion of Section 230 real quick. Sure. Um, you made the point that reading 512 in a way that's sort of negating the benefit of 230 doesn't make sense. Um, but Congress explicitly carved out IP um, from Section 230. So do you think that's an indication that they think um, the approach should be different or do you think that you have to read 512 in a way that supports 230? Yeah, so th I mean, so think about the conversation we're having. What, what the, the way in which 230 is relevant, despite the fact that 230 doesn't protect you from copyright claims, I recognize that, is what 230 very clearly says is that online services not only have a right to, are encouraged to, and are protected from uh, uh, challenges where they seek to uh, remove content from their services because they find it objectionable, it's sexually explicit, lewd, violent, all of these things, whether or not it's legal or not, 
platforms are given a right by Section 230 to make decisions about for can, their can service. Can you reconcile that, though, with, like, Sorry? UMG talking about, you know, going to 230 and 512, right, where the service provider pr plays an active role in selecting, monitoring, marketing content when you're actively involved in encouraging or editing listings? I mean, there's another line of cases coming out of sure. 512 talking about this type of issue. And then maybe we'll go to Ms. Prezer, too. Yeah, let me, okay. so... so I, there's certainly language in the 512C cases that, that sort of goes both ways on this. There's, there's not a case that I'm aware of that's ever held or, or even actually suggested that, that by making decisions about what content is good or bad, what content you want on your service or you don't, you actually fall outside 512C. And what I'm saying is that that result, which to, to, to the extent that anyone might argue for it, to the, court, to the extent that any court might, might suggest that that is what 512C requires or, or is, should be interpreted as, um, is inconsistent with, the, with what we know Congress wanted in Section 230 and inconsistent with, with what I think is uh, valuable and useful public policy that, that goes well beyond the issue of copyright and goes to what is the, uh, what is the kind of Internet that, that we want uh, and what are the kinds of things that we want on, uh, on platforms. Ms. Prezer, what do you think? Um, moderating to have the kind of Internet we want, but, but obviously no duty to monitor for infringements? I think you can guess what I think. Um, yeah, I, uh, I object to the notion that uh, uh, a moderator curating content uh, implies no safe harbor is suddenly bad for content. That we are at, we should actually not embrace the Mavericks decision on this ground because now all these sites that would otherwise have been uh, filtering out our infringing content will stop doing it. Um, so when that day happens, um, you know, it, it will, will really take notice. But the reality is that nobody is curating for copyright at this moment. They are picking and choosing content that they like and do not like, in Mr. Willen's words, um, for reasons of their own. Um, porn is bad, cat videos are bad, and violence is bad. And so they're going to pull that stuff out. Bad quality um, files are bad, so they're going to pull that stuff out. But infringing content can stay and, unless and until a takedown notice is sent. And so the notion that uh, a service provider uh, would lose its safe har harbor uh, seems entirely right to me. Uh, if they demonstrate, if an ser online service provider demonstrates that it is going into the content that is being supplied by users and picking and choosing among those files, it should have the obligation to do that for copyright infringing works as well. So, so do you agree with Mr. Willen that there's a distinction between, you know, prior to upload and post upload, or, or where would you draw that line at, you know, filtering out the violent videos, um, you know? I actually don't make a dis no. distinction between pre and post upload. Mm -hmm. If the serve, whenever an, an online service chooses to curate, for its own purposes, that is the moment they need to uh, filter uh, for copyright infringing content. And I disagree that we will end up with a lot of junky sites that nobody wants to use anymore. I think what we'll end up with is sites that have imposed filters, which are widely available and not terribly expensive. And I realize that's not what uh, the courts have, have deemed is required by 512. Um, but I think that those rulings uh, are limited to uh, pure uh, uh, upload at the direction of the user cases. Well, sir, could I ask, so is, is there any distinction in your mind <clears throat> between um, the situation in Motherless, monitoring at just a very sort of high level for, um, you know, child pornography yeah. or, or, or things like that yeah. on the one hand, and uh, a more uh, curate, curating function along the lines of choosing content that is suitable for the site. I mean, there's sort of a continuum, right? I mean, you talked about image quality could be one characteristic that people rely on. Um, Mr. Willen seemed to be, I, I don't know if I'm characterizing your views correctly, but it, you seem to be saying that um, it's hard to make those distinctions 
and that you know if we say that um, you know it's it's um, unacceptable to 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 screen out certain types of content, it's difficult to have a principled way of knowing uh, you know what constitutes curation or not. Do you do you agree with that or how Look, do you there see the distinction? There clearly is a continuum. Uh, I think. And the courts have zeroed in on that and made some law around it. Um, I guess what I'm asking you, I mean, do you think Motherless got it right? I mean, Motherless said, well, at a, at a minimum, surely, you know, it would create bad incentives, wouldn't it, to uh, say that as soon as a site decides to screen out uh, really highly objectionable or, or illegal content, that suddenly that would put them outside of the safe harbor. Um, but the court said that's quite different from what's going on in Mavericks, for example, which is you know, uh, much more focused on choosing the content that is along the lines of the theme of the site. Do, I mean, is, is that a distinction that's, that's workable in your mind? Or do you think that if a site you know, has any sort of screening before stuff goes up, that that means that it's not posted at the direction of the user any longer? I think, I think Motherless makes perfect sense given the way the law has developed around Section 512C. Uh, part of our uh, position in these roundtables is that uh, the court started veering off the correct interpretation of 512C 10 years ago, uh, and that uh, it should always have been the case that if a site demonstrates that they can control the content on its site at any level, they should, uh, they should be filtering out for uh, copyrighted content. Given that the law didn't develop that way, and that's a, you know, my own little you know, science fiction fantasy, sure, motherless makes a lot of sense given the way things have developed and to make a distinction between truly curated uh, in the Maverick situation and the, uh, the somewhat more uh, pedestrian uh, filtering for, uh, you know, for kitty porn or whatever. I, I guess I'm a little confused then, though. Let's say we had a new 512. I'm not saying we're going to have a new 512. Mm -hmm. But if we did, wouldn't that return us to, it sounds like your position that if a site filters for anything, they should have to filter for copyright infringement, too. So then we get back to the position of if you're gonna, if you're gonna screen out child porn or snuff videos or whatever it is, aren't you then, aren't you then suggesting an obligation that they should also have some sort of a filtering technology for copyright infringement. I think it demonstrates the ability of the site to filter. I don't think there should be lines, the, the whole point of 512 and the safe harbor <clears throat> is that service providers should have to do what they can in order to protect from copyright infringement. Uh, the And we got to this weird place where they can, and they demonstrate their ability to do that, but they only have to do it with thing, everything but copyrighted inf material, right? So it, it, it's, a, it's an odd world. Mr. Lemon, what, what do you think? What do your member companies think about that? The ability to filter, you know, compared to the statutory language about ability to control on some of these issues? So, you know, I think uh, content moderation is a very difficult subject to figure out, and we, we're seeing that policy discussion roll out in a variety of ways. One of the things that we have to remember is that the vast majority of content moderation is fueled by users. It's by users flagging objectionable content that the platforms then are able to respond to, which is largely the way that the DMCA works. They respond to flags. Now, the fact that uh, a, a platform may find that it has the resources to dedicate to some sort of proactive content moderation, uh, the idea that they, can, that they can take a hash set that exists that can identify specific images and somehow apply that before things get posted, uh, that the fact, the idea that that would automatically trigger a whole host of other responsibilities that would subject, you know, the, the failure to comply with them would subject them to significant liability is, is, is really, really problematic. And the sense that um, if, we, if we take the, the level of responsibility that platforms have to say, if you can filter, then you must, well then it automatically implies questions of what does can mean well, what do you think about the Zaslow court, right, where they, they looked at you're your taking user uploaded content and you're sticking it on a coffee mug, right? And they said it doesn't even matter if it was automated or not. That would just show an abdication of their ability to evaluate that in a physical product. Do you think that 
court got it right? Um, I mean, I think that that when you're talking, you know, I'm not sure of exactly about a coffee mug. Um, right. Is the know, line just that it goes into a physical product, or or does that have any meaning for other? Well, I, I, you know, I think that uh, there's certainly different uh, legal implications that are brought into play if you are a service that proactively takes a copyrighted work and and begins to market it yourself on a physical product that it, it, you know, that implicates. Is there a difference between marketing on a physical product and marketing for eyeballs for ad revenue? Uh, I think that it, it gets more complicated uh, in the sense that uh, it depends on the volition. You know, it depends on the the, the amount of uh, active human involvement that goes into making those decisions. Uh, much of what the platforms do rely on automated processes, and and much of the the voluntary measures that that the platforms take rely on automated processes that honestly don't always make the right calls or the best calls. They're not human eyes. I mean, even human eyes make the wrong calls sometimes, and that's why we have this back and forth collaborative process that allows the platforms and the rights holders to be able to figure out with the user whether the specific instance of a work being posted is actually a violation of copyright. And I think that we need to take into account uh, the sheer number of things that we're talking about here. Uh, you know, in, for example, Reddit between 2015 and 2017, or sorry, 2016 and 2018, had a 725% increase in the number of notices that it received. And they went from 610 takedowns in 2016 to 26,234 takedown content removals. And so, now part of this is just Reddit developing its maturity as a company. But we have to recognize that it's a very quick ramp up. And so if we say, if you can moderate, then you must, then we have to say, well, what does can mean? Does that mean that you have to fire other employees that you are working on other projects in order to dedicate resources to proactive filtering? I and mean, when we look at what Google has done and they've dedicated over $100 million to developing content ID and to ask a platform, any platform, to be prepared to make that same investment the moment that they decide that they're going to try and perform any sort of content moderation is, is really problematic. So we, we heard a lot at the last round of roundtables and even a little bit of a minute ago about um, different expectations for different size companies, uh, also on the content side too, that just... 512 um, is not sort of one size fits all. It applies a little differently depending on the company and the, and the um, capabilities. Uh, folding that into what you were just talking about, do you think there would be disincentives to having some sort of a standard like that that kicks in at a certain level of size or staff or um, active, active moderators or whatever it is? Uh, yeah, I think that, that there, there's some problems with that. I mean, uh, first off, companies ramp up so quickly. Uh, in the internet world, you know, we have members who within one year had enough users to all of a sudden lose the small business exemption for for privacy, GDPR, and things like that. You know, this is, and, and if you're talking about monthly users, well, then what month are they liable and what month are they not? And if you're talking about employees and, just like you said, hiring a certain number of moderators, why would you hide, hire the third moderator if it's going to bring in all of these these rules that you could just stay with two and, and do your best to, to do your best with two. You know, uh, I think it really is, it's complicated. Mr. Winterton, did you want to comment on these issues? Yeah, I just wanted to um, quickly push back on the idea that there is inexpensive filters that companies can just easily employ that prevents um, uploads. Um, in some other work that I've, I've done in the past on internet sales tax, for example, we were told that there would be inexpensive software that on online retailers um, could purchase that would allow them to just basically pay tax to out of state, to other states that they don't operate in uh, or don't physically exist in. Um, inexpensive software does not end up being inexpensive when you rely on it to be able to run your business and to be legally compliant. Over time, software can raise in price and software can... Um, you know, be very expensive to integrate into whatever uh, company or business that you run. Um, on the other hand, we think 512 has struck a good balance where small platforms can survive without having to rely on uh, software that could uh, be too expensive for them. 
but uh, larger platforms can make efforts that small platforms can't and do so. Uh, one example that comes to mind for me um, is a friend of mine on social media likes uploading uh, videos when he goes to uh, dr drag shows and nightclubs and those live videos are taken down within a couple of minutes and have very few views. Um, I think that there is a lot of evidence that we have struck the right balance and that ruining that could do a lot of harm to expression online. Mr. Hatfield, do, do you agree with Mr. Winterton's characterization? No, I don't. No, I don't. I, to, f for the people in my community, the issue is m monetizing the content. The issue is not whether it goes up or not. I mean, we, there are some people who don't want their, their music, say, for example, on, on the internet. Something like Content ID, which, um, uh, as Mr. Lemon just uh, said, was created, or actually it was invested in to a, a great deal by Google. They have a very funny way of allowing certain artists to use it and others not to use it. Now, they'll tell you you can go to affiliates, but the affiliates essentially are going to make a percentage of whatever money is generated from it being posted. So their, their incentive is to post it, not to block it. So ultimately, it, if you read some of the stuff that the, the senators talked about uh, in the uh, additional materials when they were writing uh, the DMCA, they talked about the idea of standard technical measures that once they became available, that a company couldn't block other people's uh, artists' access to it. So. I question just how expensive something that's already been developed is to implement. And again, I come back to something that is going to be required for all music anyway, like ISRC codes. How hard can it be to come up with something that registers? Like if I am a musician that's dumb enough not to put that in my music, then I can't protect myself. But if it's there, how, hard, how, how expensive is that going to be to, to, to read when it's already in every single digital audio code that somebody might upload? And it would say who the copyright owner is. So if you're not the copyright owner, you can't post it. Well, so let's turn to, to standard technical measures, whether or not there you've been developing in the last couple of years, whether case law is encouraging the development of these as the, you know, the statute sort of anticipates and whether it, it's done so well in the, the shadow of the rest of the statute. Um, Mr. Carey, did you want to comment on that? or uh, or Somewhat previous? relatedly, mm -hmm. um, you know, given, you know, the way this case law has evolved and what I think is a bit troubling from our perspective is that, you know, there's this subjectivity that's allowed once content is uh, on a platform and we're seeing the ability of, of services to somehow either curate or filter. Um, but not incur liability. The upshot of all of this case law from our end, we maintain an in-house anti-piracy program that's manual, um, not automated. The software costs are prohibitive to us as the content owners to be able to invest in broader scale um, you know, copyright enforcement. Um, and simultaneously, we're also deprived of what's uh, you know, theoretically in the statute on its plain language. We can't send a representative list because that's been denied. Uh, the red flag knowledge has been read out of statute. So we, on our ends, have to spend all of our time gathering URL by URL for each individual piece of content that we identify as infringing um, and have none of the benefit of something that's, you know, should be, um, you know, uh, able to be uh, calibrated for a balance on the other side. Why can't we give a representative list? And if you're able to, um, you know, uh, filter out on your own platform, you know, that content which is uh, potentially infringing or do anything to search on your own capability, um, you know, there's an inherent imbalance from what we can do, the availability of resources to us offensively and a larger shield for them defensively. Mr. Osterreicher? So in following up on what Mr. Hatfield said, where they encourage musicians put that code in, we encourage photographers to watermark, as is in the case in Mavericks. It would, it would seem to be objectively obvious, just as if you can recognize kitty porn, you should be able to recognize at least that some image has been watermarked and do something about it. So would you, would you think if a platform would have an obligation to screen for something watermarked, is that your suggestion? or? I think at the very minimum, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, short of that, oftentimes the information as to who owns those images has often been stripped out on an upload. But unless you actually crop the image to the point 
that you're getting rid of the watermark, that's, that's pretty hard to do, and it should be obvious to anybody that there's a watermark there and someone owns it and who that someone is. And, and do you think that watermarks or, or other types of uh, content management information in, in the photography, you know, the image setting, um, are, are you encouraged that there is standards for this or do you think the industry is evolving? Do you feel hopeful or pessimistic? I, I, I'm encouraged that, um, you know, the technology is getting there that hopefully will make it to the point that the owner of the image will not be able to be separated from the image itself so that it will always be there uh, no matter what's done with it so that people then have the knowledge as to who that is owns that image and whether or not they need to get permission or a license for it. And how would um, a service provider know if the image was uploaded by, if the user is the content owner or if the user had been given a license? What if it was a you know, wedding photography I mean, if it was my wedding, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't be my watermark on it. How would they know I had uploaded it and I had authorization? I think that's certainly a problem, but at least we need to be able to start with somebody being willing to identify that there's a watermark there and recognize it, and then where does that go from there? I think that's something that we, we need to work on, but at least it's just not a free-for-all of there's an image, it's up there, and we don't really care who it belongs to. Okay, uh, Professor Tishnet. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to note that the ability to match hash values for specific child porn images already identified in a database is completely different from the ability to uh, figure out a generalized uh, symbol and that may vary entirely in its content from picture to picture. And the New Zealand shooting actually gives us a tragic example of how the touted ability to filter has been vastly overstated. Uh, it's well reported. The YouTube, YouTube which uh, is everyone's model, even though it's the thing everyone hates, right? They're doing it as well as anyone can, and they can't do it very well. Uh, if you want a law regulating alphabet on antitrust grounds and governing how YouTube can treat musicians, the DOJ knows how to do that. This is not the right place to do that. And let me just contrast our site. So back to what we were talking about, uh, about curating, we terminate users who harass other users. We terminate users who engage in commercial solicitation. That's against the rules of our platform. We get well under 10 DMCA notices per year for millions of works. And to say that the fact that we have a terms of service somehow makes us liable to install filters, which, by the way, Google will not sell us, uh, I think is just a not just a rewriting of the DMCA, but a really bad idea. Well, so getting, I was, I mean, getting back to Mr. Osterrecker's watermark point, I mean, should, should a watermark at, at a minimum constitute red flag knowledge? I mean, should that at, at a minimum trigger some uh, further duty to investigate in your view, or, or, or does, it, is that not enough? Absolutely not. Uh, so uh, for one thing, you know, we don't filter. Like, we, you know, we don't actually, uh, uh, so, you know, that's not the kind of content that gets on our site. You know, we would certainly respond to a takedown notice, but uh, we don't have filters. So, the, uh, and the idea that it would be red flag knowledge, I think the example of the wedding photo is a great example, right? So, uh, a lot of the stuff that we get is, you know, created by our user. So a user might, exa for example, take a picture of herself in her Catwoman cosplay. And she uploads it. She may well put her watermark on it because she wants, you know, when it's on Instagram, you know, she wants the attribution to spread. It's still hers. The idea that we should somehow flag her as a copyright infringer uh, and basically go to war against our users, it, it, it's not right for, for what we are, right? And, you know, if there are sites that you want to target with, you know, antitrust style rules. I think that's a real conversation to have. It's just not the right one for this mechanism. I guess, in the, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, and this is maybe bleeding into the knowledge standard topic, which I guess is okay. I, I mean, so you say that, you know, you'll, you'll take stuff down when you're notified. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what short of an actual notification would be uh, sufficient in your mind 
uh, to trigger a further, to, you know, to what, what would constitute red flag knowledge and, and or what should constitute red flag? I mean, give an example of something that, that would, um, either for your site or, or others, that would trigger uh, a further obligation to investigate. Well, so, uh, you know, I should say I have the most detailed knowledge about what we do on our own site. So, uh, I, you know, we, uh, we would definitely investigate someone who, you know, not doing the notice, said there's a whole copy of Harry Potter up here, right? That, that seems like we, we take a look at that. Um, but there are also people who make tons and tons of mistakes about stuff. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of busybodiness online. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes, sometimes we get notifications used as harassment. So we've had people actually fake uh, being from the copyright owner to try and get somebody else's stuff that they're in a fight with, having that. Yeah, so I know, but I mean, that, that, all is, that all is actual notice, though, isn't it? I mean, you know, if somebody says we've got Harry Potter on there, that's a specific work, and it's actual notification that it's up there. I'm just trying to right. figure well, so out. Right, so this is why I think courts have struggled with what red flag notice is, because it's very clear that generalized notice that there might be something out there is not red flag notice, because then we're back to the same system. Right, system, right. But right? I mean, so what we've heard from other folks is that right. courts have effectively read it out, and then, it, you know, other people say, no, no, it still has meaning. And so I'm just trying to find an example. Right, of so, and what so it was. I, I agree. I can't remember which court w w was it that said, like, the sports metaphor is actually not helping yeah. us very much here. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's very hard to say in the abstract, in part because of the variety of sites, right? So, you know, if you have the hypothetical Kaczynski site, harassthem.com, right? Um, you know, that's the or I think the other hypotheticals have been like stolen celebrity photos, right? Uh, you know, maybe. But that has so little relationship to what most people are doing that it's actually not a great guide for like what I should. Mr. Lemon, do you, do you want to comment? Because I think Professor Tish at her site is maybe smaller and doesn't filter, but your member companies are, are bigger. I'm probably not going to solve yeah. your red flag problem. No. Uh, I do think it's really challenging. Um, you know, I, because, especially because when we talk about the scope again, and I, I, I'm going to bring that up because, you know, YouTube sees over 300 hours of video posted every minute, and Facebook sees. Uh, you know, Instagram, sorry, I lost the number, but it's 100 million photos and videos each day that are posted. And so then we're left with the question of do we expect people to be monitoring the, each of these posts before they're posted to check against the general catalog, or are we expecting people as they're looking through the content that's being posted to recognize copyrighted works. Well, do you agree with Mr. Carey and Ms. Pariser that red flag knowledge has been effectively read out of the statute? Uh, I don't have an opinion on that. Okay. Um, what about if, if you are a company that has the ability to filter against a database, do you think um, you should, is there sort of best practices at least to also employ that for other types of databases such as if there were an image database? Uh, I think that there's actually a lot of collaborative work going on, uh, especially in recent years between internet platforms and, and rights holders, uh, especially as internet platforms become rights holders as they have in the last few years. Uh, you know, some of our companies have won Oscars, Grammys, Emmys, uh, Golden Globes. You know, we, our, our interests are aligning in a, in a really spectacular way. Uh, that I think has led to a lot of ongoing conversations, monthly calls, uh, lots of efforts to try and figure out these best practices. And, and it really is in the interest of, of our membership to have uh, the best quality uh, experience for our users, and that usually is, is legal content. So that was, um, you know, pretty optimistic, but would you say it comes down to stay tuned, or is there something specific you can point to? Um, you know, I think that there are lots of ways uh, in which folks are, are collaborating. You know, uh, Facebook, for instance, getting uh, licensing deals with publishers and recording artists so that we can monetize some of this product that, that's getting posted. I think that, that there are examples of, of a success that has already happened, and I think that we are 
optimistic and engaged in trying to figure out best practices going forwards in in the proactive, voluntary, effective measures context. And I think what, if I can just add one more thing, which is that our concern, only concern really with these voluntary effective measures is that by engaging in voluntary proactive, uh, you know, above the requirements of the law activity that we are somehow suggesting that this should be the new law. And that is just not the case. It doesn't make sense for the variety of platforms, for the size of platforms, for the ways in which people interact with, with their platforms. It doesn't make sense to change the law to just because people are trying to do more than the law requires. I mean, the law would say there's an obligation to accommodate standard technical measures subject to whatever they are, right? Uh, I, so yeah, but yeah. I, I, yeah, I just mean yeah. any, anything yeah. above, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. what, what, what it requires. Hold the bare minimum, yeah. Mr. Osterer? Yeah, just following up on, on the w wedding photographer example, I, I think, you know, more likely what's happening these days is since so many people are taking selfies and they're their own pictures, you know, if you're putting a copyright on, if you're putting, um, uh, I'm not a copyright, a watermark, or if you're putting the CMI in, and it's your image of someone else, I think there should be at least a certain standard um, that would trigger further investigation. I, I know it's not an easy thing. If this was easy, we all wouldn't be here kind of going back and forth with each other. But you know, at least from our perspective as photographers, we're really hoping that there will be something that will allow um, th the works to at least be flagged in some way for further investigation, whether or not that changes um, how they're posted, where they're posted, when they're posted. I'm not sure that that you know what that's going to be, but at least something rather than these billions of images that are out there and they're just there with you know Would people you posting that? them on their own or or people posting the works of others. In your view, is that better accommodated through sort of a voluntary initiative, or do you think the law would require the something more? I, you know, I'm I'm open to either one. Whether you know a, a standard could be developed that wouldn't necessarily be voluntary, but just as we've seen from some of the platforms that they're working towards ways in recognizing the creative work and and the monetization of that and how to figure out a way to share that, I would just hope that that would eventually apply to small creators. Thank you. Mr. Torrent, can you talk a bit about your company's experience? Yeah, I would like to point out that the technology is there. Content ID is by far not the state of the art. And I think uh, the services are able to adopt content filters at scale. I don't think there is anything much left anymore. Um, just to kind of point out on the scale, uh, 671 minutes of content are being uploaded now to YouTube. Um, 671 hours every minute. Um, and that is just growing every year um, by around 100 hours. And so I know it looks scary from, from where we are standing today, but imagine that uh, we will be back in 1930s and every financial transaction will be in this situation, eventually you have to find a ways how to identify the content and how to deal with it, not just on the copyright base, but on any other base, be it terrorist videos, uh, child pornography, or anything else. I do believe that once you are engaging in one, you should start, or the platform should start being forced to um, look at the others. I'm not saying that the, everything will be solved day one. Copyright is complicated. Fair use um, adds to it, but, um, I think there needs to be some start for innovation to occur. You cannot have innovation in isolation. And so, because there were no forms of, um, of financial backing of the innovation, because the rights holders tried their best, but usually they took the measures from non-technical point of view. Let's say musicians, what do they know about writing sophisticated AI code, right? And so, um, they picked the most obvious um, ways, and those are usually f selection of manual with some tools uh, that were built within the community, but you cannot get the state of the art without the backing, and the backing is not, cannot come, come from the rights holders only. And so I think the platforms have some responsibility in this case, and I think 
I, I'm not talking about particular business models, but there is innovation not only just on the technology, but also on the business models being revenue share with something like a content filter or in similar scales. Mr. Rillen, do you want to speak to, to these issues, the voluntary measures or the development of standard technical measures? Well, I was, hope, I was hoping to just say something about the, the red flag knowledge issue and the, yes. the knowledge standards, because I think so, some of the uh, the shade that's been thrown at the, the court's interpretation is being thrown at the, the Viacom case and the, the, the law that developed after that. So I just wanted to, to sort of explain how... how sure, in your view, what, what's the red flag knowledge? Yeah, I mean, so 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 the, the idea, which I think is, is clear both from the statute and legislative history, uh, it is, is is twofold. So so one is that the distinction between actual knowledge and red flag knowledge isn't isn't the distinction between specific knowledge and general knowledge. It's the distinction between objective and subjective, right? So actual knowledge is you you know in your mind that something is true, uh, and, and and what people call red flag knowledge is uh, there are facts and circumstances in the world from which a reasonable person would determine that that's true. That doesn't mean that red flag knowledge is being read out of the statute when it is interpreted that way. What it means is that it's being applied consistent with the text and intent of Congress. So, so what would be red flag knowledge in the absence of, you know, getting a specific link, um, you know, of something that is infringing? Well, so, I mean, I, I think the, the courts have, have – so every court that has looked at this, it's the Second Circuit, it's the Ninth Circuit, it's, it's every district court virtually, has sort of come to the same conclusion, which is that this is a narrow – provision. Again, and it doesn't mean that it's not in the statute. It just means that it's narrow. And there's there's reason for that, right? So you can look at the legislative history and you can see things like the members of Congress debating the statute saying that red flag knowledge would mean something that is apparent from a brief and casual viewing, right? So, so everyone recognized that the circumstances in which you would actually have knowledge, be it subjective or objective, would be narrow. And that reflects a couple of things. It reflects, one, that the main vehicle for removing things under the DMCA was never meant to be unilateral action by service providers. It was meant to be notice and takedowns, where you have a cooperative relationship. And it reflects the fact that these things are really, really difficult. Copyright infringement, unlike child pornography, unlike figuring out whether something is, is terrorist content, um, is hard, and it requires a lot of background knowledge that service providers do not necessarily have. And I think the examples about uh, ph photography is, is sort of a useful uh, way of thinking about that. So if something has a watermark, that tells you what? That, it's, that someone owns the copyright. But that doesn't distinguish uh, those kinds of photographs from basically any photograph that's on the internet. Every photograph that's on the internet has a copyright that belongs to somebody. Um, and that's not the issue in terms of figuring out whether something inf is infringing starts but doesn't even come close to finishing with the question of does somebody own the copyright. It's still hard to think of an example, though, isn't it, of, of what would actually qualify as red flag knowledge. I mean, if, it, you know, yeah. if, if a YouTube username is, you know, pirated songs <laughs> and YouTube becomes aware mm -hmm. of that, I'm not sure that would qualify as red flag knowledge, would it, because it doesn't relate to specific works. Whereas if the, if the title of a video is, you know, um, stolen uh, Sgt. Pepper's uh, yeah. album, then that's, sp that's actual knowledge, I would think, right? Well, it may or may not. I mean, you know, one of the funny things about the, the, the YouTube case is that there was a huge record that was developed that never really got uh, into the, any into of the opinions. But, but there was a very considerable factual record in that case that showed that a number of clips that had been posted on YouTube with titles exactly like that had actually been posted by uh, copyright owners or their agents as part of sort of stealth or viral marketing campaigns. So, you know, that was, we had a very, very concrete set of examples there to show, look, the fact that you might see some, uh, some description of a video or description of content as, as describing it as stolen well, Even it, that it's didn't. a standards objective, though, and it's called Stolen and Sergeant Pepper. You don't think that's enough to investigate? I think I think it, I think there are examples like that where it might be, and I think you know okay. you have full full length you know movies that are, haven't been released that are being uploaded to sites where there's no reason to think that that movie should be there. Sure, I mean I think there are some there probably are some obvious examples that we could all agree on, but but you know this conversation isn't really about those those examples. This conversation is about an attempt by, by our, our, our friends on the other side of this debate 
to say that, that somehow the courts are getting it wrong when they are saying that this is a narrow provision. And, 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 and they're not. Um, and the, the, the problem with, with that view is that it fundamentally ignores uh, the reality of, of what's on these sites, which is you know, a, a huge amount of content, all of which in some ways is copyrighted. And, and the question of, of what it, of that is infringing and not is going to turn on many, many factors, most of which are not in the knowledge or control of the, of the service provider, but instead are with the copyright owners. Listening to this discussion, it almost seems like we're presupposing that the ISPs never use their own site. Because, for example, um, YouTube, when you type in Karen's favorite artist, Beyonce, mm -hmm. you know, half of the videos are no video, it's just lyrics on the screen and the song. And surely by now Google has received enough notices to say that that is infringing. This is not you know, the video that has been put up by the record company. Or, you know, another example, as much as I love Pinterest and I spend way too much time on there, you know, the entire model, you know, it's a great bookmarking site, but it bookmarks by taking images. And I have no need to bookmark my own site. So if I'm bookmarking something on Pinterest, it's pretty, you know, it stands to reason that I don't have a license for what I'm bookmarking. And so at what point do you just have to sort of say, we live in the real world and these people have been on their sites and they should know something? Well, yeah, so I, I, I represent both those companies, so I, there's a, certain things I can't say. Uh, and I would also want to let the, the, the Google and YouTube witnesses that are speaking at the next panel talk about that, although I, would, I, I think that with respect to, to YouTube, Almost all that is licensed at this point. All the, all that music. Um, so so some of these issues, you know, certainly on the bigger platforms, have been dealt with through through licensing. Um, and so we're in a very different world now than we were ten or fifteen years ago. Um, you know, and, and then with respect to Pinterest, just very very generally, you know, the other part of the equation here, which we've touched on a little bit but haven't really talked about, is is the fair use piece, right? And particularly when you're talking about the use of of things like images as social bookmarks, you get into case law, which which comes from the Ninth Circuit in particular, uh, that, that was in the context of image search, um, and, and says that there are many instances where we're using thumbnails or, or versions of, of, of photographs for some different purpose can constitute fair use. And so we have to think about that part of the equation as well when we're having these conversations. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Parizer, did you want to comment on that, or really at this point, anything else since we're nearing the end? Sort of watching all these cases evolve over a very long period of time, what strikes me is how the goal keeps moving from the content owner's perspective. Motherless is an interesting case because uh, the court says uh, it, they're looking at the pornography that Motherless received and um, the plaintiff says, well, you should have known uh, that it was infringing because it was so well produced. And the court says, you know, a lot of porn is very well produced now. Um, and conversely, a lot of professionally produced porn looks kind of amateurish and grainy because that's a style of its own. It's not as if they're dealing with a full-length version of a Marvel movie. So the court is holding up the professionally produced studio movie as the paradigmatic, the paradigmatic example of what would confer knowledge. But in the case where the Marvel movie is the subject of the copyright infringement case, there's some other reason why that would not be sufficient notice. For example, uh, we didn't send a... Um, a notice that specifically identified that file. So going back to the YouTube decision, which I think Mr. Willen very accurately summarized, if you put, if we go back in time to the moment when that case was brought, when those files were not licensed, those were full length music videos at issue in the case and the court said, yeah, but the site didn't get uh, a notice that specifically identified the file identifier. So no red flag knowledge there. And I also think you have to understand this in the context of representative list and the red flag notice, both 
you know, going down with the ship because you can't even send a catalog of your works and have that confer red flag knowledge, which is what the plaintiff at Sazel tried to do. They sent a catalog of their photographs and the court said, yeah, but those aren't DMC notices, so that doesn't count either. So moral of the story is, uh, as I think Ms. Isabel and Ms. Hammer were saying, uh, it, it, we've yet to see the case where uh, represent, red flag knowledge or representative list is actually worked in all of this time. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll kind of do a last call going clockwise. So Mr. Shamari. Uh, thank you. Um, I did want to just briefly address the uh, efficacy or perhaps the lack thereof in, um, in requiring copyright notices as a form of uh, policing. I mean, I I'm almost surprised that representative from a copyright agency is going to be saying this, but um, unfortunately, in our experience, while we don't discourage uh, the use of copyright notices and works or, um, you know, embedding uh, copyright notices in the exit data for especially digital photography, unfortunately, most of what we see in terms of infringements, therefore, images where all that data has been stripped, and it's very easy to do so, and the copyright notices have been stripped, uh, either illegally or perhaps through a, a license, uh, but then it was copied over by some third party. And um, I think going back to this, this discussion we're having, a rather lively one about uh, red flag knowledge, I mean, I think because a lot of these, um, these ISPs that have some level of human curation can retain that kind of red flag knowledge for a lot of works out there. I mean, we deal a lot with uh, celebrity photos or even some historical photos. It's obvious that a, a user who selected their age as 20, 21 years old does not own the, very likely does not own the copyrights to an image created in the 70s or early 80s. And at least that will raise a red flag to someone who's working at the ISP or acting at the behest of the ISP to understand that that is very likely an infringement, or very likely not, not owned by that user. And so uh, the use of a, a copyright notice has no effect in that equation, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. So we are technically out of time. We're going to let everyone who has their placard up say, um, speak. So Professor Tushnet. Super fast, two things. A, a note on repurposing sites. You don't actually necessarily know what your users are, do, are going to do. So Pinterest and vaccine denial has been much in the news. Political uses of Instagram. Be careful not to assume that you know what sites are for when you're thinking of, uh, about the variety here. Second, do, do you take Ms. Isbell's point that at a certain point that you kind of do know how people are so, using No, actually. Your site? So actually, there's a great reporting on YouTube about the different verticals in YouTube. So there's actually like six or seven different YouTubes. Okay. Um, and but I mean, that's six or seven is still kind of well actually uh, and and there's debate about you know which one of them uh, they should be but uh, I also briefly want to say about the representative list from the other side of this like we occasionally get people sending us a search string that's dynamically generated and looks different when we look at it and they say everything here is infringing and that's obviously not even true like even if you believe everything about what they say they own it's obviously not true so for example like it will be you know, uh, it's somebody who claims a single photo and they say the search string for the Harry Potter fandom, every link here is infringing. So just, it's not one side. Not all this work. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carey? Very quickly, um, just to respond to the question we've been talking about a little bit, um, I would love to be able to uh, send a takedown notice that subjectively conveys red flag knowledge. Objectively, I have absolutely no idea how I would do that. Wouldn't have any idea how to tell someone on my anti-piracy team how to send something broader than what we send currently, which is URL by URL. Mr. Hatfield? Um, Congress originally stated its intention to be a safety to appropriately balance, sorry. Congress stated in its intention through the DMCA to appropriately balance the interests of content owners, online service providers, and information users. It seems to me that the balance between freedom and individual responsibility is a bit askew. And for the onus to always be on the copyright owner seems to me to be at least unfair. There is technology out there. ISRC codes for music anyway are going to be required, or you're not going to get paid through the Mechanical Licensing Collective of the Music Modernization Act. So as a starting point, since if you go back to the dawn of when all this stuff started and when the law was written, AOL was the dominant uh, 
thing online. It, look, look what we've got now. There's no way of knowing where any of this stuff is going to really go. It's like, like several people have said, it's, we're in unbelievable times of evolution and change. All I'm suggesting is that if you use something like upload filters, and you can identify who owns the copyright with ISRC codes. It's there. The information's there. You've registered your music with the Library of Congress. You've got ISRC codes. It's Nobody, not quite how it works on they, the IRC. They, 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 know, they basically know, they know who owns it. If the person that's uploading it doesn't either isn't the copyright mm -hmm. owner or doesn't have the rights to upload it, you block it. Okay, uh, Mr. Osterreicher, and I know you had mentioned Fourth Estate. If you, no, you, you know, I'm, I'm, up to you. I'm going to just give an overview. Yeah, having been on the roundtable three years ago, I still think this is a tale of two takedowns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the the one side versus the other side. Um, I think three years ago we were really talking past each other. Uh, I think, at least from my perspective, there's just a little bit of recognition, at least for the plight of the individual creators, as to there's a problem and hopefully, you know, we can work towards solving it. And I appreciate um, uh, you having us all here to continue that discussion. And maybe in three years, we'll even get a little bit further. <laughs> well, we, we all very much appreciate everyone coming today and everyone being in the audience. I think we are now going to take a 10-minute break and start again at 1045. But thank you all so much for your contributions.